Kansas City millions of years ago, Dr. Richard Gentile. What we want to do this evening is to reconstruct the geologic history of the greater Kansas City area. And everything we know about the geologic past, we read from the rocks. Where the rocks are absent, why that interval, what happened during that interval of time is lost forever. But uh, anyway, we're talking about the rocks exposed underfoot that you see in the greater Kansas City every day here. And it's already been pretty well covered. This is my uh, book, Rocks and Fossils of the Central United States, with special emphasis on the uh, special emphasis on the greater Kansas City area. Now, this is the second edition. It came out in 2015 here in January, and it's put out by the uh, Department of uh, Geology. University of Kansas and the, by the Paleontological Institute is special publication number eight. And uh, so that's everything I'm going to talk about tonight is based on this book that you see here. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about rocks. Now, this here is a typical exposure of rocks that you see in road cuts along the greater Kansas City area. Also, you see rocks like this in excavations for large buildings, and notice they're layered. These are layered rocks in here, and uh, there's usually two major rock types, shale here and limestone, and those al alternate over a tremendous uh, a number of feet throughout the section. But uh, some of these rocks can be traced for hundreds of miles, all the way from Iowa down into Oklahoma. They underlie the greater Kansas City area, like pages in a book. They're everywhere except where they've been eroded away by modern day streams, such as what you see down here. The Kansas River's right down here. This is I-435 in Europe, of course, approaching the Kansas River. So, of course, these have been eroded away. But everywhere else, they underlie the city in here. And as I mentioned, we've got two typical uh, types of rocks in here. One of them is limestone, which usually forms ledges. It's light gray. And then there's shale in here, which is usually dark gray, but it's typically covered by uh, vegetation, so you don't see it. It forms slopes. And there also sometimes you can find a coal bit in there or maybe some sandstone. So we have these two major rock types that underlie the greater Kansas City area. That's called the bedrock. And here's another excavation here, which was taken place in 1970 and 1971. Uh, this here is Main Street, and this is Pershing down here, and this is the Crown Center uh, development here, which is about 1970, 1971. This is one of their major hotels going up in there. But notice along the highway here, along Main Street, you've got, again, limestone shale, limestone and shale in here. And this is another view of that excavation here at, uh, at Crown Center Complex, 1971 and 1972. But the odd, odd number beds are limestone. That would be seven, five, three, and one. And the even-numbered beds are shale, which is six, four, and two. And so notice there's at least uh, 75 feet of the section here. Here's Liberty Memorial, and here is the uh, Union Station or Sign City now down here. And so as I mentioned, these rocks are continuous over great distances, and they underlie the greater Kansas City area. This city is built on these particular rocks in here. And let's go back now to 1889. They're excavating the basement for a large building here, which was the Emory Bird Thayer building. It was opened in 1890, but this is 1899. This is Grand Avenue. This is 11th Street. And the workmen now are excavating this building. They're in a dark gray shale, which we call a Liberty Memorial. 
And notice back in those days, they didn't have the equipment they have now. They, they excavated these basements with picks and shovels and also perhaps horse-drawn scrapers. And what they're doing here is they, um, they're stripping up great big slabs of shale, loading it up onto these horse-drawn carts. They're excavating the basement here, and as they got down to about the several feet, they hit a bed of shale, which was only about six inches thick. And it, um, it was a, contained a wealth of fossils, world-class fossils, of uh, all different types of species. But the major uh, fossil that they found there was called a crinoid. And this here is a uh, specific name, Delocrinus, Missouri, Delocrinus missouriensis. It's in uh, growth position, and what we've done is taken off the cover, or the skin of it, as you want to call it, and show the uh, specimen what it looks like. So these are composed of plates of calcium carbonate. And as there's a hole fast, it's uh, held to the seafloor. And then there's a long stem, which is composed of what we call columnals. They're like little dimes together. Then, of course, there's a cup in here. And in that cup, there's, of course, a, a mouth. And these arms in here pick up microscopic particles of food. And then, of course, they convey them back into the mouth. And here's an interesting structure, which is sort of an enigma along the evolutionary highway, an anal sac. But we believe the anus was at the end, and it may have been to get the anus away from the mouth, or it could have been used for respiration, we don't know. But really, a crinoid belongs to the uh, class Echinodermata. And uh, you can take a starfish and turn it upside down and then put a stem on it, and you've got a crinoid. Now, they're almost extinct. There's still some down in the southwest Pacific, but they grew in these ancient seas by the numbers of zillions in here. But here now is one of the specimens that was collected from that excavation in 1889. Notice the detail on it here. This here is a crinoid. And uh, what happened here was back in those days, they could get into these uh, excavations and collect specimens. So the uh, fossil collectors would swarm down into these pits and they would rip up these big slabs of shale. They would bring them home and there wasn't much to do around Kansas City in 1889. <laughs> and so they would spend the whole winter there with a needle and a brush and usually there would be only a little bit of this exposed. But they would take their needle and their brush and they would remove all of the matrix and bring the specimen out in relief. They did that to about 400 of these slabs. And they're now uh, in museums and collections throughout the eastern United States and Europe. I've seen them in Ireland. I've seen them in Germany. And of course, this one here is in the Smithsonian. And uh, but it's a perfect state of preservation. This area in here must have been a shallow sea with uh, beautiful uh, preservation potential. These specimens sank to the bottom, then they became covered by mud rapidly before predators could get at them and rip them apart in here. Now, as I mentioned, these are composed of little plates in here. You see these little plates? But you can find crinoids now along the exposures here in the greater Kansas City area, but generally they fall apart. What you find is only some of these plates. You never find anything like this in a perfect state of preservation in here. Now this, this specimen here is a side view of Aziocrinus magnificus. And uh, this is what it looks like on the bottom view. Now notice the detail of this in here. These uh, small pinules, which collected food and then conveyed it down into the mouth down in here. So that one's in Smith Smithsonian Institution. Now these here are in our geosciences uh, museum called the Richard 
Richard L. Sutton Museum of Geosciences at New York KC. And this, this is one of those specimens that were collected there in 1889. And of course, somebody spent a lot of time bringing this out in relief here. This is Ethylocritus magister. And here's a side view and here's a bottom view. Here's another specimen. This one is Delocrinus missouriensis, and incidentally, this is a state fossil of Missouri, Delocrinus missouriensis in here. And one of the specimens from this area in here, of course, is uh, the name bearer. So here again is another uh, view of Ezeocrinus magnificus with this long anal tube here, which I said is sort of an uh, enigma on the evolutionary highway here. We just don't know what the purpose was. It could have been to remove the anus away from the mouth, but it could have also been used for respiration. But these are found usually by people in the outcrop, and they bring them in. They think they've found a uh, ear of corn. It's not corn. It came, came off, of a, off of a crinoid here. Well, look at some of the other fossils that we get out of the Kansas City area in here. Here is a Muria missouriensis. It's a trilobite. Trilobites are crustaceans. They're arthropods, and uh, usually they fall apart because they're segmented. Generally, you get the pygidium, that's the tail end, or the cephalon, which is the head part of it. But this one's in a perfect state of preservation. It was found in about 1880s in downtown Kansas City on a limestone bed. And I was very fortunate here one year. I was doing some field work just south of here in Cass County. And I found one of these with this almond-shaped life, eye here, still preserved. I mean, these are really little tubes of calcite in here. It's like a fly's eye. It has about a, several hundred of these individual facets in here in a perfect state of preservation. And uh, that eye is probably more sophisticated than anything we have around the day. It's actually better than a fly's eye. But just what that creature did with that great gift, we don't know, because we don't know what type of brain it had in here. So that's another enigma here along the evolutionary highway. Now here's a uh, slab of limestone from 87th Street and Blue River Road down there. It came out of a unit called the Middle Creek, but it has uh, several species on here. You've got a trilobite, pregidium, the brachiopods in here. You've got pieces of crinoids, which I have to find in here somewhere. Also, you've got bryozoans, lacy bryozoans, twig shaped bryozoans, and there's a spine from also a echinoid in here. That's all on one slab. So these rocks are beautifully uh, fossiliferous, and uh, so these all live on that seafloor that you saw here. But this is a reconstruction of what it looks like in the uh, throughout the central mid-continent here, back during the time we're going back about 300 million years. We'll talk about that a little later on. But this was the sea bottom. And uh, notice here we have our crinoids, Ethylocrinus, uh, Delocrinus, Azeocrinus right in here. We had some strange fishes with large circular structures of teeth in them. Uh, also here, sponges, uh, bryozoans, uh, various brachiopods and uh, clams down here. And so that's what it looks like. You see, the uh, we're going back to an interval of time long before the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were 50 million years in the future. There was no mammals, no flowering plants at this time. It was mostly invertebrates, but they, of course, were... Uh, many different types of fishes, and uh, also amphibians. The reptiles were still evolving at this time. But at times, these seas would retreat. You see, they didn't stay here forever. Now, what we have here is an uh, instant of time. Here's an instant, instant of time in the geologic packs. A delta is building westward following the retreating sea. Here's the sea retreating. And of course, deltas are building 
uh, westward following the retreating sea. Notice rivers are bringing in sand and clay, building deltas as the sea retreats and the headwaters for these rivers were in the rising Appalachian Mountains and also in the Ouachita Mountains down here. And so that's an incident of time and here's Kansas City right here. Now Kansas City was on the equator. We were within five or ten degrees of the equator here. And as these seas retreated, why then on those alluvial plains, we got vast uh, rainforests. And they were composed of plants that uh, we don't have today. Some of the descendants are now very diminutive little fellows in here. Here's one that is a Calamites. It's a scouring rush. Those were tree size. Now they're about the size of your finger, and you find them along uh, railroad tracks and in ponds and marshes, things like that. But this, this period of time that we're dealing with here was called a, um, the age of ferns. But there were huge fern trees. They had fronds on them, which were 15 feet long. And what we find sometimes at the end of one of these fronds is the first seed, which gave rise to all of the flowering plants that we have today. And here's a tree called Cordates. It had great strap-like leaves on it. Um, it was a forerunner of the uh, evergreens. And then here's another tree called a Lepidodendron. It had a, a uh, bark on it, which looked like a snake skin. And so those are some of the uh, types of plants that lived. But also at this time, there were amphibians. Some of those were huge sprawling creatures, uh, weighed two, three hundred pounds. We had dragonflies, which are 18 inches across. And also we find the first reptiles, which are about the size of a lizard. And those were found near, uh, just south of here, at one little town down here. And uh, this one here, we have it eating a cockroach. The cockroaches were around back then at this particular interval of time in here. And so that is a rainforest, which of course followed the retreating sea. And, uh, but many of the rainforest plants were giants in size. The modern day, the modern day descendants are ferns, horsetail, rushes, club mosses, and comprise a small and insignificant part of the present day floors. They represent only the tip of a complex evolutionary iceberg submerged in an ocean of geologic time. That's a statement by a very eminent paleobotanist in here. Now, I don't want to go over this in here. You, this is all in my book, but it tells you what these different, uh, different types of plants are in here. Here's all of the names of them in here. They're all named. Now, this is a seed called Truganocarpus. These occurred at the end of a fern frond, but it gave rise to the vast array of flowering plants that we have today. It's about the size of a pecan here. And here's a fern frond. That was found in a, 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 a excavation down near Ottawa, Kansas, and uh, it's in sandstone. It probably grew on some sort of a floodplain where streams were bringing in Bring it in sand. This is Allothropterus tree fern. But as I mentioned, some of these got to be uh, 15 feet long because they were really trees back in those days. And this is the interior mole of the trunk of the exterior of Calamites. That's that scouring rush. This is the interior mole of it, and you can always tell them because they're uh, because they're uh, segmented. But here's the bark of a lepidodendron tree. A lot of times they find these overlying a coal bed in some mines. And they think that they uh, found the uh, petrified snake. It's not a snake, it's from a tree. And here's a uh, leaf from the Cardades tree. As I mentioned, those are gymnosperms. They gave rise to the evergreen, these great evergreen forests later on. <clears throat> So now let's put all of this into a time frame here. Um, everything that I've discussed up until now, the rocks, the 
types of creatures that lived, lived during what we call in here the Pennsylvanian system. We're going back about 300 million years. This is the geologic time scale. But the time scale shows the divisions of uh, geologic time from the origin of the Earth, 4.6 billion years ago to the present up in here. But Kansas City is built on rocks laid down about 300 million years ago during this Pennsylvanian period of Earth's history. And I mentioned at that time they were mostly in verbets, no flowering plants, or uh, the reptiles were first beginning their reign here. At, and of course there were amphibians, but no, uh, no mammals yet. And of course one of the questions I yet quite often is, uh, can we find dinosaur fossils in the greater Kansas City area? Well, I hate to uh, disappoint people, but no. That's because the dinosaurs lived during the Mesozoic era in here, which was from 248 million to 65 million years ago. We don't have any rocks here of that age. So as I mentioned, where the rocks are missing, what happened during that interval of time is lost forever. And uh, so um, we don't find dinosaur fossils here. If you ever do, I let me know. I'd like to see it. <laughs> but uh, they, they usually find bones of uh, various types of, uh, um, usually a cow or something like that, but they think they found a dinosaur fossil. So that's putting the rocks underlying the greater Kansas City in a time frame here. This is by our geologic uh, time scale in here. And I'm not talking about, we're just talking about the rocks that are exposed at the surface. These are underfoot. What underlies all of this? You go through these various geologic uh, periods of time back to the Precambrian. If you drill a hole here, you'd go down about 2,000 feet. You'd go through a lot of layered uh, sedimentary rocks belonging to these various intervals of geologic time, and then you would hit granites, which was probably the roots of an old mountain range that stood here about 1.2 to 1.6 billion years ago, but it's been eroded down to a flat plain, and then the seas came in and laid down this thick sequence of almost 200 feet of uh, 200 feet of uh, sedimentary rocks in here. Now, let's take a look at um, what the Earth looked like back 300 million years ago. This is the supercontinent of Pangaea in here. Approximately 300 million years ago, as I mentioned, Kansas City was on the Paleo Equator. Here's North America, sort of in a diagonal position. Um, this, of course, would be Eurasia up in here, but it's very important that on the southern hemisphere continents up in the high latitudes, there was extensive glaciation. Continental glaciers covered southern South America, uh, southern Africa, Australia, Antarctica, India was still down in here. And so that's what the world looked like during this great supercontinent of Pangaea in here. Now let's, uh, let's take a small part of this in here and blow it up in here. <clears throat> you see, here's Kansas City now. As I mentioned, at this particular time, we have the sea covering the area. But the Rocky Mountains weren't there yet. What we had was a lot of low-lying hills, which they call the ancestral Rocky Mountains, and the seas would enter in through some of these passageways and then they would transgress across the interior of the North American continent to the uh, foot of the rising Appalachian Mountains over here in Pennsylvania. But uh, now, as I mentioned, all the continents were together, forming that great supercontinent of Pangaea. South America was pushing northward, forcing and pushing up the Washita Marathon Range in here, which is down in Arkansas and Oklahoma now. Africa and Europe were abutting up against the eastern seaboard of the North America, forming the Appalachian Mountains. And of course, when this was happening here, we'll get into this a little later on, of course, these the mountain-making forces were being transgressed in, or transferred into the 
center of the in mid-continent in here. So now let's get back to the rocks in here. Now, uh, as I mentioned, what we have here is limestone, shale. Now this particular bed had a little coal bed in here. These all have names. This would be the Westerville, and this here would be the Cement City, and this would be the Quivera Shale. The limestone, shale, limestone, shale, they alternate through hundreds of feet of section. In Missouri, there's at least 2,000 feet of section with this alternation of limestone and shale. Well, what caused that? You see, there has to be a theory for this sort of a thing in here. This just didn't happen. And, uh, well, let's see. The mechanism that controlled the fluctuation of sea level responsible for the alternating marine and non-marine transgressions and regressions of seas over large areas that has been debated by geologists for a hundred years, but yet we do have some major, major theories for it. Now, let's get into a little bit of theory here. The glacial control or glacial eustatic theory of what caused a marine transgression. Now, as I mentioned, we, the southern hemisphere continents were covered by continental glaciers. And at times those glaciers would melt and all of that water would be poured back into the sea. Now let's go through this here. Uh, the disappearance of ice sheets on the southern hemisphere continents by melting during an interglacial warming trend raised sea level and estimated to be on the order of four or five hundred feet. The interior of the North American continent lay near sea level. The sea entered through passageways and ancestral Rocky Mountains in West Texas the modern day Rocky Mountains were millions of years in the future. They didn't arise until we get up into the Mesozoic. The rising sea transgressed across the interior of the low lying continent to the foot of the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, then to continue this, now the major the marine part of the rock section, particularly the extensive limestone beds, were laid down in shallow, warm seas that are composed of alternating shells. But the limestone beds are composed of the very skeletal remains of these invertebrate organisms, things like clams, snails, uh, uh, crinoids. But they uh, lived in these seas by the zillions, and of course their skeletal remains settled to the bottom they became altered into beds of limestone because they use calcium carbonate, the same mineral that composes the limestone beds. Now, some of the limestone beds could have, of course, been uh, chemical precipitates, but the limestone beds are marine. It, and so we see here the major part of the rock section was laid down in these extensive seas that extended across the interior of the continent. Now, what about a marine regression here? As I mentioned, the seas would retreat, and then, of course, we had these vast rainforests growing on these delta globes that built westward in here. But the buildup of thick and extensive ice sheets on southern hemisphere continents during a glacial interval lowered sea level Worldwide, as the sea retreated westward across the interior of the continent, large amounts of sediment eroded by rivers with their headwaters in the rising Appalachian and Washington Mountains built deltas that followed the retreating sea, laying down beds of mud, that shale, it's also some sandstone, testimony to the extensive rainforest that grew on the delta globes is the beds of coal from converted plant material that are interrelated with the shale. But geologists, we estimate that it took between about uh, 235,000 and 400,000 years for one transgression and regression of the sea across the low-lying interior of the North American continent here. Now, the cause for marine, this is, of course, a continued on. This is the glacial control theory. Uh, in summary, the repeated buildup and melting of ice sheets on the southern hemisphere continent resulted in worldwide eustatic rise and fall of sea level. 
as the sea advance was accompanied by the deposition of the marine part of the rock section, and as the sea retreated, the non-marine terrestrial part of the rock section was deposited of the marine portion from the advancing, over the marine portion of the advancing deltaic lobes. This process was repeated over and over again, laying down thousands of feet of alternating limestone and shale beds. And so when you drive along these highways here in Kansas City and you see these layered rocks, you'll have an idea of how they got here. And uh, then there's another theory which I'll go over briefly in here. It's called the diastrophic control theory. Fluctuations in sea level were the result of the instability of continental uh, instability of the continental interior caused by the process of mountain building. As I mentioned, all of the continents were together. Uh, the Appalachians were rising in the east, and the Washita Marathons in the south. Of course, those particular mountain-making forces were transport, transported into the interior of the continent, causing an up-and-down movement. Whenever the interior of the continent, of course, was depressed, you had a sea moving in covering it. Whenever it was uplifted, the seas retreated, and you got a rainforest in here. But the instability of the continental interior resulted from the collision of the continents that formed the sub supercontinent of Pangaea. South America was pushing northward, forming the Washita, Wichita chain of mountains in eastern Oklahoma and western Arkansas. The Appalachians rose when Europe and Africa butted up against the eastern seaboard of North America. The stresses from these mountain-making events were episodic and translated into the interior of the continent, causing an up and down movement. It could have been continuously downward. It would also work like that if you look at these theories in here. But that again is the uh, continuation of the diastrophic control theory in here. The subsidence or downward movement of the mid-continent allowed the sea to transget accompanied by the deposition of marine rocks, particularly limestone. <clears throat> the following uplift favored the deposition of terrestrial sediments that formed the deltas yeah, following the retreating sea. The deltas of how the rock section was built is still being debated. But there is generally in agreement that the processes that form then acted over a long period of time. What you see there isn't just local. These were global types of uh, episodic events that were happening all over the world in here. The two theories, I believe the two theories operated at the same time, creating a sequence of rocks not repeated again during any interval of geologic time. This has never happened in the geologic past before the Pennsylvania or after it. But you had mountain building and you had the glaciation on southern hemisphere continents, but whenever you drive along the highways here and you see these excellent exposures of rocks, of course, what we have here is a world-class laboratory. There's none better anywhere in the world. Now, we were talking about the Pennsylvanian period in here, but you see, as I mentioned, everything we know about what happened in here, we read from the rock record. <clears throat> and so now we leave the Pennsylvanian period, and we go up to what we call a quaternary. The quaternary is divided up into the Pleistocene epoch, which began about 2.6 million years ago, and then the Holocene, which we're living in now, began about 11,500 years ago, and that's just a flicker of geologic time. So what we have in here is the missing rock record. <clears throat> the rocks from the end of the Pennsylvania up until the Quaternary, we do not have in this area. If they were probably were here, they'd been eroded away. Most likely dinosaurs roamed across this uh, land surface. I believe they've found a few tails in sinkholes down in the Ozarks, but there's no record of them. Their skeletal remains were probably entombed in the rock record, but they've been eroded away. And as I mentioned, where you don't have the rocks, what happened during that interval of time in here 
representing 299 million years is lost forever. We don't know what happened. So if you want to find out what happened during this interval of time, you have to go somewhere else in the world where those rocks are exposed and you piece together the time scale here. So the Quaternary period is subdivided into two epochs. The Holocene and the Pleistocene represent only a flicker of geologic time. The Holocene are the recent epoch accounted for the last 11,500 years, and the Pleistocene began about 2.6 million years ago. Uh, if the 4.6 billion year age of the Earth were compared to a 24-hour day calendar, the Holocene would account for less than one half second of Earth's history. That's what we're living in now whenever you look at this 4.6 billion year age of the Earth. And then the Pleistocene, commonly called the Great Age, Ice Age, that's when continental glaciers moved down south as far as the Missouri River here. The Pleistocene would only represent the last 50 seconds. Uh, Yet from our perspective, the Pleistocene is very important. The Pleistocene was the time when ice sheets of continental dimensions advanced and repeated, retreated numerous times over the northern hemisphere. Large groups of animals evolved and attained great size. Then most of them became extinct and our own species emerged. See, during the Quaternary, the continents were all together just where they are now. They had assembled or they had broken apart, forming the continents where they are now, and these vast seas that once covered the interior of continents are now gone. The con these seas are restricted to the continental shells around the continents, and uh, so we don't have like, any case like we had in the geologic past. Like in the Ordovician, uh, seas probably covered at least 60% uh, of the continental interiors in here. But uh, and of course, the types of vegetation and animals that lived, about 90% of them are still alive that lived during the Great Ice Age. The ones that really took a hit were these huge mammals, like mammoths and mastodons and saber-toothed cats. Most of them, of course, are, are gone. Well, let's take a look here at, uh, let's go back here to uh, Right before the glaciers advanced, we're going back about 2.6 million years, and uh, this is what the central mid-continent looked like. Now, the major stream there was the Kansas. Here's Kansas City, the Kansas City flowing from west to east. The uh, Missouri River was represented by the ancestral Missouri River, which entered up here in northwestern Missouri near Tarkio. It's probably the southern continuation of the Platte River. It flowed southeastward and entered the uh, Kansas River about 70 miles east of Kansas City near the town of Brunswick in here. And now notice the uh, this light blue line is the present-day Missouri River. And it, throughout most of its extents, it flowed due south, almost due south, and then it makes a great big bend here at Kansas City, and it moves, flows eastward. Well, what caused that great bend <clears throat> in here? You see, there was probably more than one glaciation in here. Let me... Uh, well, you can read that there. I've already uh, mentioned that in here. But you see, as these glaciers move southward, just how many glaciations we had, I believe at least two of them got as far as the Missouri River and they even jumped across the river into downtown Kansas City here. Uh, a continental glacier isn't concerned with mountain ranges or rivers. It goes right over them. And this is what probably would happen here. But you see, as these, um, as these continental glaciers, we've, we've uh, recorded at least six glaciations in northern Missouri, north central Missouri. There was a glaciation, and there was an interglaciation when it was just like it is about now, and another glaciation. So some of those probably got as far south. So what was happening here as a glacier lobe 
would push southward, the river then would follow the glacial, would follow the end of the glacial lobe, replacing the river southward until finally the last glaciation was down here. And so you had a glacial lobe in here and the Missouri River was flowing right along the edge of it. That's why you get that great big bend in the river there. <clears throat> but this, of course, is a, a map showing probably the extent of glaciation during the Pleistocene, and of course, much of Northern Europe was, of course, covered by that particular glacial episode here. And you can, uh, you can put the Missouri River right here flowing southward and then making a big bend here at Kansas City flowing along the front of the glacial lobe here. So now, how do we know that glaciers once covered this area? Well, again, we're looking at the rocks. And a glacier is a poor housekeeper. A glacier will move over and pick up anything it rides over. And a valley glacier, anything that comes from the surrounding mountain ranges will fall on the ice and it's carried away in here. But this is a, uh, a deposit of glacial till. Now, this is up in Canada near the Athabasca Glacier. This is a modern day uh, uh, photograph here. But glacial drift, this here is glacial till. Uh, it's composed of everything the glacier was carried. The glacier is melting away there, dropping everything that it's carrying. And it's a heterogeneous mixture from um, clay, silt, sand, all the way up to great big boulders here. It just dropped. That's what you call a glacial till. And then uh, once streams got a hold of glacial till, then it removed the finer particles, the silt and the clay, left behind deposits of what we call outwash here. It's outwash from the front of the glacier. The outwash is derived from glacial till and has been worked by high velocity streams that flow from over and underneath the glacier. So the finer particles have been removed, leaving behind a lot of sand and gravel here large deposits. Well, we see the same thing here in uh, Kansas City. This particular photograph was taken along Highway 210 over at Nabo Hill. This is a deposit of till. Notice it's blue-gray in color. And there's a large boulder there by the geology pick. That's gray granite. That is not uh, native to this area. It's what we call an erratic. It was carried at least 250 miles in glacial ice, and then whenever the glaciers melted down here, it just dropped it here, and it hadn't been worked by water in here. Some people call this just a boulder clay. And here's another exposure. This here is along a, um, a um, roadway leading to a mine by near Missouri City, just north of the Missouri River. But what we have in here is outwash, which is mostly sand in here. Here's glacial till, notice the blue-gray color, and then there's a great big block of uh, winter set limestone, which is probably picked up not too far away. But boulders that size have been carried at least 250 miles, and they dropped here, much of it north of the, north of the uh, Missouri River because that was generally the southern extent, but glaciers did get across the Missouri River here. So how do we know this? Now this here is a um, exposure. This was taken in a quarry now. Here's the Pennsylvanian rocks. They go back 300 million years. This here's a bed of shale that's marine in origin, has marine fossils in it. Here's the Pleistocene. The glacier that we record that got into this area was about between 650 and 750,000 years ago, less than a million years. And so what we have here is glacial till overlying the uh, Pennsylvania. And this particular dotted dash line in here called an unconformity represents about almost 300 million years of Earth's history that is lost there. And so we have the Pleistocene resting right on top of the uh, Pennsylvania in here. <clears throat> so notice we have the uh, Pennsylvania 300 million years ago resting right on it and a quaternary 2.6 million years. 
divide it up into these two epochs in here. But this is at the maximum modification of the drainage system. That's when a glacial lobe jumped across the Missouri River into downtown Kansas City in here. Here's Kansas City. But I have found glacial till on the tops of the highest hills in downtown Kansas City at a uh, elevation of about 940 feet. And then when we were putting in the Trans-Missouri River Tunnel, which brings water from the water treatment plant in North Kansas City to south of the river, that pipeline was uh, built at a depth of about 300 feet under the floodplain of the Missouri River. And in some of our boreholes, we had glacial till down there. And so if that was the same glacier that entered downtown Kansas City, the uh, till at the, under the floodplain was at an elevation of about 550 feet. And of course, the till at the tops of the highest hills, 950 feet, that's about 400 feet. So that glacial lobe was at least 400 feet thick whenever it moved over downtown Kansas City. And that boggles the mind when you think of an ice sheet covering downtown Kansas City less than a million years ago. But what happened here was that uh, you see, this ice slope dammed up the Missouri River. It formed a large um, ice margin lake. And as those filled with water, they cut a outlet channel through some of the uh, some of the surrounding area in here. And then they took a shorter route. Now, these streams, such as Turkey Creek and the Blue River, the Little Blue River, they were probably preglacial. They were probably there. There may have been other streams like it. So what happened here? There was a tremendous torrent of meltwater pouring down this uh, lower Turkey Creek Valley here, eroding it at least 100 feet deep, deep, deeper than what you see now and widening it. And then as these ice sheets retreated, why the competency or the carrying capacity of the rivers changed and they filled up with gravel. So now what you see there is broad valleys and uh, Sign City is located in this valley. All the railroad lines come in. That's an old, what we call a diversion channel. And uh, here's another ice slope that jumped across the river in northeastern Jackson County. It dammed up the lower Blue River in here, forming an ice margin lake. And it found an outlet channel. And then, of course, it took the lower Little Blue River in here. and. Uh, then as the ice sheets melted, it returned. It took the shorter route back into the um, Missouri River in here. So this here is another diversion channel, which of course carried uh, masses of meltwater. Now there's a creek that flows down that particular valley called Far Prairie Creek. You can step over. It doesn't fit that valley. It's a huge valley, and there's a little stream flowing into it. So that valley was cut by uh, by uh, meltwater from ice, continental ice sheets. So what we're seeing here is the modification of the land service in here. <clears throat> so this here is what I've been telling you about. You can read that. Uh, but as I mentioned, these uh, we probably had more than what I've recorded, at least two glaciations that reached as far south now in North central Missouri, they recorded at least six glaciations, so there was probably a lot more than uh, more than one, two glaciations that reached this far south. And as I mentioned, a, uh, a continental glacier isn't concerned with rivers. It goes, it bridges and goes right across them. And this is what happened here, damming up many of the streams, reshaping the surface of the land in here. And, uh, well, here's what it looks like today. So I mentioned you've got these two abandoned valleys, the lower Turkey Creek Valley, and then you've got the lower little Blue River Valley in here. And uh, as you drive down these valleys, they're several miles long and a mile or so wide, and they're flat bottom, filled in with uh, sand and gravel. And of course, uh, they've been modified, of course, by glaciation. 
Well, I, I can't, I have to tell you about lust now. What you see here is an outcrop along Highway 210 in North Kansas City. You see this uh, brownish tan looking uh, silt is what it is. It stands up in vertical bluffs and it can be as much as 80 to 100 feet thick along the rivers, along the bluffs. Now this is wind blowing silt of glacial origin blown off of the floodplains of the major rivers near the end of the last glaciation. Most of this is less than 30,000 years old because we find ground squirrels in it and types of, of uh, gastropods or snails living in the particular lus. Uh, the lus covers the older rocks like a blanket throughout the greater Kansas City area. It's thickest near the rivers because back at the end of the last glaciation, uh, See, the last two glaciers didn't get as far north, south as the, uh, what we call the uh, pre-Illinoian glaciation. Some people call it the Kansan, but they stayed up in Iowa, but yet you had a mass of meltwater coming down the um, Missouri River. And if you'll notice, the floodplains on the Missouri River can be very wide, four or five miles wide. Well, with all of that meltwater coming down, there probably wasn't any vegetation there. It was probably loose sediment, sand, gravel, and clay. And these strong northwesterly winds blowing across those floodplains picked up the clay and the silt. The clay was probably carried worldwide, while, while the silt, of course, being heavier and larger in diameter, it was dropped along the bluffs. And so this lust cover, it covers the glacial till glacial drift, the outwash and the till, and also any Pennsylvanian rocks that are exposed. It covers the whole area like a blanket. It gets thinner southward from the major rivers. At UMKC campus, about five miles south of the river, it's 15 feet thick. When you get down into near Belton and Raymore, it's about only a foot thick. And so it, it must have been a lot of wind blowing during the end of the last glaciation, but of course, there was uh, quite a bit of, uh, of changes in climate then. So this here is lost its wind blowing silt in here. So I had to mention that. That sort of uh, gives us all of the rock layers in Kansas City. The Pennsylvanian, 300 million years ago, overlaying by glacial drift, outwash, and till less than two million years old, overlying the Pennsylvanian, and then the lust cover, covering all of that in here, which is wind blowing. So that's the history read from the rock units. But here's an outcrop here, I'll show you this one here. Here's glacial till, notice the blue-gray color with a lot of boulders in it. This here is layers of sand and gravel outwash, Here's more outwash, here's some lusts, and here's the modern day soil profile. So that's what you read to get the geologic uh, history of this area. So now I'll close here. As I mentioned that most, about 90% of the, the plants and animals were here during the Pleistocene, all the continents were together, but this here, the ones that took a big hit were these large mammals, but this here is a scene along the Kansas River at Bonner Springs near the end of the Pleistocene. About 11 to 12,000 years ago, we have a herd of Colombian mammals moving southward, probably from their grazing grounds up north. They may have migrated, just like certain creatures do now in Africa. They're crossing the Kansas River and there is a little one here which is caught in the current to be swept to an untimely death. And the, uh, the uh, skeleton remains probably will be entombed on a sandbar and then some lucky collector can come along and find the remains of a young mammoth here. <clears throat> but these are Colombian mammoths now. The uh, woolly mammoths, they, most of those lived farther to the north, but now we find with the DNA that some of them got farther south, and they did breed with the Colombian mammoths, which had probably a lot shorter hair on it, and they lived farther to the south. But some of the other animals in here, here's a uh, ground sloth. Those were the size of a grizzly bear. They had huge claws on them that, of course, were used to dig up 
roots and also to pull down branches and they strip tasty leaves off of the branches with their tongue. Now, of course, these slouts are uh, about the size of a cat and you see them hanging up in trees down in Central America and South America. But here's a giant beaver. Those got to be almost the size of a small cow, but they probably didn't make dams. They probably just ate vegetation. And over here is probably the greatest predator of the Pleistocene, is Arcotus sinuus. It's called a short-faced bear. Those could stand 11 feet tall on their hind legs. They had a reach of 13 feet with long legs. They could probably run down a horse or a camel. But they were a super predator. And also, sitting on top of this hill over here, this is a diorama which is made up by John Babcock. Most of these uh, scenes that you see in here were done by him. He's an illustrator. And uh, he does all this work with an electronic brush. It's not done with a paintbrush. But as you'll see this, here's some of our bedded Pennsylvanian rocks, and here's a less overlying it. I don't show any glacial till between it, but sitting on the hill up here is three Paleo Indians. They're watching that herd, and they would like to come down and get some breakfast, but of course, they see this sharp-faced bear in here. So that's the scene going back at the end of the last Pleistocene Ice Age, and of course, 60% uh, of these large mammals are now extinct, but the interesting, we had several glaciations, at least six of them here in Missouri, and some workers will tell you we had at least 20 glaciations and interglacies, whenever it became just like it is now, probably just as warm. But you see these large herds of mammals, they lived through the interglacials. They actually prospered, they diversified, they got larger, only to become extinct 11, thousand years ago here. Most of them becoming extinct and of course just about everywhere where we find the skeletal remains of these large mammals you find evidence of humans, their artifacts. So it probably wasn't, uh, some workers will tell you it's climate, but it wasn't climate because they got through several interglacies only to become extinct here in here. But let's uh, sort of move on. Now here's a uh, the jaw and the mammoth tooth here from a young mammoth. It probably was about 10 years old when it died. And uh, it was found in the glacial materials at first in Lidio Street in the 1880s. This is about the size of a man's fist in here. It's a baby mammoth. <clears throat> I like to tell the kids when they come to our museum that this is that baby mammoth that you saw there in the diorama being swept away in the current here. And, uh, but that's sort of a big fib because it was found somewhere else. But here is a, a short-faced bear. Interesting, this fellow here had a face not like a wolf or a dog, but more like a cat. But notice the long legs on it. And uh, as I mentioned, it could stand, uh, had an arm reach of uh, 13 feet, stood 11 feet tall on its hind legs, and it was fast enough to run down a camel or a horse. Well, how do we know it was here? Well, here's a fellow by the name of Clotus Hunt. I don't know what happened to him. I used to, be, used to go over. Now, he collected specimens from out of the Kansas River, right about where that Highway 7 bridge covers. It covers the river there, and uh, he had a whole basement full of them. I mean, uh, skulls and tusks and uh, jaws and teeth of mammoths and that. But here he's showing a... Uh, He's showing the short-faced bear, uh, that's the generic name, the foreleg, from the wrist to the elbow. And that was identified by the University of Kansas uh, vertebrate paleontologist here. So you can imagine the size of that fellow in here. But here's the uh, megalogus, which is a ground sloth with large claws, and incidentally, it's the specific name, of course, is after Thomas Jefferson. He found these in a cave, and he thought they came from some large cat-like creature. 
And he told Lewis and Clark to keep his eye open and see if he didn't find something. But these really came from a ground sloth, and they use those claws for various purposes, probably for defense, as well as pulling down leaves in here. And of course, they're extinct. And uh, here again is one of the claws. But these range from all the way from Alaska down to Florida. But we found only four of these in the sandbars over there in the Kansas River. And so, well, I'm, a, I'm sorry here, but I've been going over time. So uh, that's about what I have to say here. So if you've got any questions, well, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you.